All right, this is Psalms for Beginners. Uh, lesson number eight, the Suffering Psalms. Suffering Psalms. Talked a lot about the uh, different types of Psalms, uh, but I want to remind you that we must not lose sight of the fact that the Psalms are not merely re religious poetry divided up into categories. You know, we've really been looking at it kind of technically, you know, objectively. We haven't drawn a lot of the lessons out of it because uh, this course was more to, to get an idea of how they were written, why they were written, what types there are, how to, uh, how to interpret them, a lot of the background material, but I haven't, you know, I haven't drawn lessons uh, from them. Uh, so we need to remember that they're a record of people's experiences in their relationship with God, recorded through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For example, the questions that arise when a person recognizes that God is present and judging our lives. You know, wisdom Psalms look at that and teach us things about how God sees us and how we should live before God. Uh, the awe that one feels when contemplating God's creation and the revelation through His word. And so you know, nature psalms and word psalms, these are the things that kind of expand on this experience. And then the joy experienced for those who recognize and repent of their sins as well as give themselves to the worship of the true God. Penitential Psalms, we've looked at those. When men, and we've read a couple of David's Psalms, how, how he felt after he sinned and the you know, calling out to God for forgiveness. And then of course we've looked at worship Psalms last week. The experience of people going to Jerusalem to worship. A lot of people think worship Psalms are Psalms that they used while they're worshiping but worship psalms are not those type. They describe the feelings people had when they worshiped, when they you know, went to Jerusalem. The first time a pilgrim has arrived in Jerusalem and how he feels about that. So the worship psalms talk about that. There are times, however, when life is filled with hardship, calamities, death, in times such as these, God wants His people to come to Him in prayer <clears throat> and petition. Usually it's the last thing we do. <laughs> we try everything else and then, you know, might as well pray, can't hurt. But God wants us, we, God wants us to have prayer as our first line of defense, not last. So as, far as, as far as these, this poetry is concerned, such times occur to the poets who wrote the Psalms and the suffering Psalms describe the times of trouble as well as the requests that they made while they were in trouble. So as I said, there are nine different categories of Psalms. The suffering Psalms are times when the poets, the writers were suffering obviously and they called out to God. Okay, some technical things. There are two main categories in the suffering Psalm type. The first is general, general type of suffering psalms. These describe in a general way the suffering that some people bear, whether it's an illness or depression, loneliness, oppression. Usually the writers talk about the thing that they're going through. Uh, many of these are like wisdom psalms asking the question, why? Why is this happening to me? Why should I be suffering while somebody else is like, you know, they're happy, you know, wicked people are happy, they're making money and they live a long time and they die in their own beds. You know? and, and, and here I am, I'm suffering. I'm going through whatever. Why is this happening to me, God? Now there are usually different lessons taught in the same psalm and overlapping ideas that are taught in the same poem. So those are some of the technical things we, uh, we notice about suffering psalms. And then there are imprecatory, imprecatory psalms. 
That term comes from the Latin word to pray for. These Psalms call on God to curse or destroy the enemy who is responsible for sin or the, the suffering of the writer. And they're pretty harsh. <laughs> I remember one particular Psalm that he's talking about you know, uh, his enemies. You know, we should go in and grab the babies and crush their heads, you know, hit their hit the baby's heads against a rock and kill them. You know I mean, this is in a psalm. So those type of psalms are called imprecatory psalms. And we'll look at, we'll look at an example of that. So let's look at samples of general suffering psalms. Psalm 42 and 43. I can't do it, I'll, I'll throw up the verses here, but if you open your Bible, it'll, be, it'll give you a better image if you open it to Psalm 42 and 43. I want to give you a little background here. Uh, these two Psalms believe to have originally been one, one Psalm. In several Hebrew manuscripts, they're joined together. We see that Psalm 43 is the only poem in the second book of Psalms to lack a superscription, all others have instructions except this one Psalm 43. The theme is similar in that the author is uh, grieved because he has been excluded from the sanctuary of the Lord. He can't go to church. <laughs> That's what he's suffering. He, he can't go to the sanctuary for some reason. Now an interesting thing about these two Psalms, uh, 42 verse 5, and then verse 11, and then 43 verse 5 are all the same. And so they divide these two poems into actually three major stanzas. Thus if you're studying them, it can be studied as a whole poem in three parts. So part one is 42, one to five. Part two is 42, six to 11. And part three is Psalm 43, one to five. Apparently the author is a lyre player, he plays the lyre, who was accustomed to leading ceremonial processions on the holy days to the temple. And for some reason he is in hiding or in prison by his enemies in the northern part of the country. We know this because he says, I look out and I see Mount Hermon. Well, Mount Hermon's in the north. And he longs for a return to the city and to worship. Now we find out also that his enemies are not worshipers, they're not believers. And thus when he expresses his longings, they taunt him with their disbelief, and you'll see that. You know, where's your God, they say. Where's this God of yours? You're always praising this God. Where is he now? So he's in pain because even though his enemies are unjust, God has not yet delivered him, so he thinks that God has forgotten him. Isn't that, isn't that typical of human beings? We cry out to God, we're in trouble, we're ill. Someone we love is ill. You know, uh, just listen to the, you know, the prayers that the elders make. 30 year old people have cancer. I mean, and prayers going up for that person and nothing happens. It, it's fairly easy to say, well, you know, where's God when I need him? So you don't have to be a poet or a writer of Psalms to have that kind of feeling. You just have to be human. We think our faith is really strong until something comes along and knocks us over, especially something that isn't fair. I mean, it's okay, you know, I get a cold and it becomes pneumonia and I'm really sick for two months, you know, and wow, boy, that was a real experience, but that happens, right? But when something happens to you that is just not fair, it's unjust. I mean, somebody lies about you in the office and you lose your job or you lose your promotion because of somebody else's lie and no one comes to your defense. 
absolutely not fair. That'll shake your faith. God, where were you? I'm faithful, I'm doing what I do. I, I go to church, I try to be. I've, I've even preached the gospel to some of these people here in the office. And you allowed them to do this to me? Where are you when I need you? I've noticed that people don't usually quit God simply because of illness. But I've seen a lot of people quit God, you know, quit the church, quit being faithful when something unfair has happened to them. You're a man, you're a woman, you do your best in your marriage. I mean, divorce, talk about a faith killer. Whew. That's, a, that's a faith killer. The quote guilty person that you know, leaves, they usually leave everything behind. The spouse, the church, everything. And the person who is quote victimized, the person who has been abandoned, out of sheer discouragement many times, they leave the church. Because their thinking is, well I've been a good wife, or I've been a good husband, and I've done everything you're supposed to do, and I, you know, I, I bring the kids to church, and I, you know, I, I'm a daily Bible reader. Why did this happen to me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. Yeah, that, that's when we lose our faith. And if you read all of these you know, suffering psalms, you, there's, a, there's a kind of a similarity there. These people, something happened to them, it's not fair. This guy here, he goes to the, he goes to the temple, he leads in worship. And now, for some reason or other, he's been imprisoned and he, he can't, or he's in hiding or whatever, and he can't do it. And he calls out to God. So, as I say, for some reason, he's in hiding or he's in prison by his enemies in the northern part of the country. He's in pain because even though his enemies are unjust, God has not yet delivered him, so he thinks that God has forgotten him. But despite this, he continues to ask God to deliver him and return him to Jerusalem and to the normal worship that he does. So let's look at 42, uh, Psalm 42. You'll notice some of the words, we have a song that follows these words. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? There's the taunting. Where's your God? What happened to you? Mr. Religion, Mr. Goody Goody. Uh, how's your faith, you know? <laughs> How do you like your faith now? These things, he says, I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. So he expresses his deep yearning and desire to return to his former activity in worship. Note the imagery of his soul's experience, frightened, breathless, like a frightened deer, and then thirsty and parched, needing refreshment. Now, uh, verse five we'll read, will be the first use of the refrain that sees him reflect on his suffering. In other words, he talks to himself. Then the next verse I'm going to read. He talks to himself and he responds with an upsurge of faith and trust that God will indeed save him. So if we read you know, five to eight, for example, notice verse five, he says, why are you in despair, O my soul? He's talking to himself. And why have you become disturbed within me? And then he kind of, you know, he bucks up, he, he, he kind of picks himself up. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar, from Mount Mazar. So this particular section describes the struggle of faith caused by this man's suffering. There's an internal battle going on within him. The poem is introduced with his situation. He's suffering, he's taunted, so on and so forth. Verse five is the first refrain. 
where he talks to himself and then he answers himself. His surroundings, you know, the waterfalls, the mountains, they remind him of God's presence and power, but also how his troubles have flooded his life and they overwhelm him. But nevertheless, he says, you know what, I, you know, I'm going through all of this, but no, I'm going to hang in there because I know you're there, God, and I know you can do this, and I know you love me, and I know you can save me. You know, today we'd say positive self-talk. He says, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime and His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. Okay, that's that first section there, including the refrain, verse five. Now, in verse nine, he says, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So he wonders why God allows his enemies to taunt him without any response. Has God forgotten him? Don't you remember me? I'm suffering unjustly, and he's saying, because of you. I'm a believer, and they're using this against me. I mean, you have every reason in the world, God, to just strike these people down, but no. I'm still here. So it's the natural struggle of faith to think that God doesn't know or care when troubles seem larger or stronger than we are. That's what he's going through. It doesn't require faith to handle a problem that you can solve. It doesn't require any faith. You know, when, you have the, when something happens and in your mind you're saying to yourself, I got this, I, I got this, I can take care of this. This is a bad thing, but I can take care of this. It's not knocking me over. It doesn't require any faith. Courage, yes, maybe, and you know, perseverance and all that stuff, but not faith. Why? Because I got this. Faith is when, whoa, th this is a mountain too high for me to climb. This is a bridge too far for me to cross over. I, 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 I have nothing to, 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 de, to, you know, to fight this thing. I, I can't, it's bigger than me. That's when faith is necessary. And so in verse 11, he says, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. So again, the refrain that reflects on his condition and reaffirms his commitment to continue on hoping, despite the evidence that God has abandoned him. You know, he realizes that no one else can help him. You know, when he says, the help of my countenance? Countenance, excuse me. Only God can help you. Ever been in that situation? Only God can help me here. Only God can help me here. And that's where he's at. All right, so that's the first poem, 42. So verse, uh, uh, Psalm 43 is just really a continuation. The editors probably broke this up or they were in different collections. So let's go to 43, verse one and two. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So the poet calls on God to be his defender against his enemies. Perhaps he now puts the entire responsibility for his salvation into the hands of God, his defender. Even though God is silent throughout his sufferings, the author is now content to let the matter lie with God. Before, he was offering his own defense. You know, this is what I want, have you ever said that? Okay, Lord, this is what I want you to do. Here's my plan. I've got a plan, it's a good plan. All I need is for you to put it into action. So by now it's like, okay, my plan's not working. <laughs> 
I'm going to need you to just get me out of this. Verse three and four. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre, I shall praise you, O God, my God. So he repeats the idea in another way. And he adds one more idea. He calls upon God's wisdom and truth and power to rescue him and to return him to his former place of worship in Jerusalem. Not just the place, but to the very presence of God and the joy of that presence. And interestingly enough, technically here, this is like a worship psalm here where he's saying, oh, to be in the presence of God, to worship Him there. So this is where he will be able to offer once again his praise to God, a man renewed in faith. So now verse five, remember we said the three couplets? Okay, five, 11, in, ver, in um, Psalm 42, verse five, first 11, they repeat themselves. Well, the same thing happens now in verse five, of chapter or Psalm 43. He says, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. So the third repetition of this refrain to end the poem, but perhaps it's read in a different tone. This poem is about a man in trouble going through a crisis of faith and talking to himself. So the first time this verse is you know, written or spoken in Psalm 42 verse five, his faith rebukes the hopelessness he feels at the suffering that he experiences. You know, that's his self-talk. Then in verse 11, when he repeats this, this time his faith exhorts him to believe despite his bewilderment at God's silence during his suffering. God, they're beating me up, they're killing me, they're taking everything I have, they're crushing me, and even if they kill me, they will not kill my faith. They will not kill my faith. Isn't that what Jesus tells us? Don't be afraid of the people who can kill the body. You better be afraid of the person who can kill the body and then put your soul in hell. Well, for us, we don't have to be too much afraid of the people who want to kill our body, but be afraid of the person who can kill the body and make an attempt at destroying your faith or your soul. That, that person is dangerous. So the second time he repeats this couplet, it's with a different you know, mindset. And then in 43 verse five, he says it again. This time his faith declares triumph over the present distress because he knows that God still rules and can save him no matter what, no matter how great the problems are. You can take away my freedom. You can take away my belongings. You can take away my family. You can take away my health, but I know what it is that I believe, and you cannot take that away from me. You, you can't take my faith away from me. Go ahead, you know, you're going to shoot me? Okay, shoot me. That's not going to make me not believe. I can't stop you from doing what you're going to do, but you cannot take my faith. Isn't, isn't that what Peter said to the Sanhedrin when they threatened him? You better stop, you better stop talking about this Jesus guy. You better stop because you're going to be in big trouble. You, you, you can be in jail. We, you know, we're the boss around here. We rule. What does Peter, what does he say back to them? Hey, <laughs> you know, we saw what we saw. We can't deny what we know. You, know, you get to a point in your faith where <laughs> you can't deny what you know. You, you can't reject the relationship that you've had with God. I mean a real relationship. 
because you know that that's true. You, you can't, you know. Sometimes it'd be easier if you could, but you can't. So in the end, faith and continual faith during trials is what God requires of us and what gives us strength. It's not if the trial ends before we die that's important, it's if we have faith until we die that's important. And I can't repeat this enough, it's always about faith. It's always about faith. Your relationship, it's about faith. You got cancer, it's about faith. You have a kid that's giving you trouble, it's about faith. You can't get ahead at work, it's about faith. It's always about faith. Okay, so it's not about the trial, it's about the faith during the trial. It doesn't matter if you die during the trial. What matters is if you're faithful until you die. That's what matters. All right, so we said we'd talk about imprecatory psalms. So general suffering psalms, those two are a good example of you know, the type. Now imprecatory psalms, uh, these are suffering psalms when the author directly asks God to, to destroy his enemies. Now, a lot of people have problems with these kind of psalms because they seem to counteract or contradict the spirit of love and forgiveness found in God's attitude towards men. I mean, Jesus said, you know, forgive 70 times seven, turn the other cheek, let, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, you know, Romans, so we learn all of that, you know, love your enemy, right? Do good to your enemy. And then you go in the Old Testament and you read the guy saying, yeah, yeah, our enemies, crush them, kill them. <laughs> Take their babies and crush their heads. You know, and you're going, whoa, wait, wait a minute here. You know, what's going on? So let's look at Psalm 58. This is a poem written as an indictment against false rulers and judges. You mean they had crooked politicians in those days? Uh-huh, <laughs> nothing new. Imprecatory Psalms, verses one to five, Psalm 58. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? No, in heart you work unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up, uh, stops up its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or a skilled caster of spells. Interesting thing, we can see that you know, when he says, O gods, in the first verse, he refers to men men who are in rulership position, judges, rulers. These are wicked hypocrites, violent and unjust, and he says they have been that way all their lives. And when I say you know that they're men, it's because there's you know, synonymous parallelism there, because the second line he says, oh man. At first he calls them gods, and then he calls them sons of men. So they're people who think they are God, so nothing, he says, can stop their evil. I mean, a deaf snake cannot be tamed by a snake charmer. <laughs> they listen to nobody, not even to God. Now here's the imprecations, verses six to nine. O oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. 
So the imprecations here, or the pleas for punishment, are made uh, by this author. And he uses six figures in his prayer that God will destroy them. And he, he says he wants God to destroy them and he explains that in different ways. One, uh, like young lions that have their teeth torn out or water that quickly runs off after a downpour or broken arrows or a snail that has drawn up into its shell or a miscarriage, imagine, or a cooking pot that quickly heats up over the fire of thorns, those, those thorns you know, are burnt and destroyed. So all of these thoughts carry with them the idea of quick and total destruction of these enemies. This is his prayer. In verse 10 and 11, it says, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. And so the author concludes that the righteous will rejoice when the wicked are destroyed and God through his judgment will be seen to be the true judge and the righteous one. Um, and the righteous rather who have suffered will have their faith in God and their righteousness vindicated. Okay, so here's the question. In the New Testament we are taught to love our enemies, not to curse them to wait upon the vengeance of the Lord, how do we explain the presence of such curses in the Bible? That's a, uh, that's a problem a lot of scholars have. So a couple of possible explanations. First of all, these poems reflect a mindset for a people who had not yet received the full gospel. Notice that Moses never said, love your enemies. Or Elijah never said, love your enemies. What did Elijah say? Bring the 450 prophets of Baal to me now and let's kill them all. <laughs> and he was a prophet of God. And David was a man after God's own heart, right? Have you read how much bloodshed David spilled? Entire villages, men, women, children totally annihilated, and yet he was a man after God's own heart. Well, yeah, the full gospel had not yet been preached. And so these poems honestly portray their feelings at that time. Another explanation to try to kind of reconcile these ideas, number two, the Israelites identified sin with the sinner. And so to destroy one meant you destroyed the other. You want to get rid of sin? Get rid of the sinners. You know, today, you want to get rid of terrorism? Get rid of the terrorists, same idea. For example, Baal worship was destroyed when Baal worshipers were destroyed. Elijah destroyed, the, you want to get rid of the, the, you know, the Baal worship that was taking place in Israel? You kill all the priests. Get rid of them. We're done. And God had used Israel to bring judgment on the pagan tribes in Palestine. And so it was natural to see judgment as something that God began here on earth. And I think that, that's the strongest argument People understood that God would, be, you know, would destroy the evil, and in their minds, that started right here on earth. It wasn't, there wasn't the idea, well, you know, after you know, when Jesus returns, justice will be done, judgment will happen. They didn't have that information. And so they, they, they believed that God, you know, He executed justice here, not just with their enemies, didn't God execute justice with the Jews? Well, sure. <laughs> wiped out the northern kingdom, wiped out the southern kingdom, sent them off into Babylonian captivity for seven decades. So it was natural to think that, that, that God's justice would be executed right away, here and now. And also they had a much, uh, they didn't have as much information about the after life as we do today. You know, we, Jesus resurrected from the dead. 
Paul talks about the glorified body and so on and so forth. They didn't have the depth of information that we have today. And then perhaps one other reason, uh, the concept and the language of justice. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul uses a similar idea when he says, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. 2 Thessalonians 1.6. So the idea of God's judgment falling on the wicked in order to vindicate the righteous is a true one. However, in the Old Testament, the language that this truth was couched in was much more forceful and reflective of the culture, the conditions, and the enlightenment of the people. In other words, they had seen God's justice being performed here on earth against their enemies, and so they wrote in the spirit of what they saw. They had seen entire villages, entire, entire nations wiped out by God, so they used the language of that type of, of judgment. Today, what, what's our thinking? Well, today, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You don't take your own revenge. I, I'll judge. And we understand that when Jesus returns, there will be a judgment, a fair one. And everyone will be judged and receive the merit of their of their actions here on earth. Okay, I think I heard the bell. That just gives us some idea about imprecatory psalms.